Hi there and welcome to Insomnia Open Class number, I actually don't know the number, it's 100 and maybe 60, something like that, but super welcome. We are gonna, uh, as, as usual, uh, we are gonna answer questions. Well, we today, it's just myself here, but I'm gonna answer questions from, from the community, from the NATO nation, and I really look forward to it. And as we are waiting for questions to, uh, to pop up here, I uh, thought I'd share uh, just uh, one announcement, which is that um, Coach Michelle has been on vacation uh, for the last week and this week, but she is coming back next week and uh, she uh, is going to be available to do calls. And she's, of course, uh, uh, teaching in the um, Insomnia Immunity Group as well. So uh, welcome back, Michelle, next week. And um, what else? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was going to, I had something I want to share, you know, as, as usual. Uh, when we have a live open class before we have questions, I'd like to share, you know, some thought or some insight or something like that as well. And I, I, something really interesting came came up, came up. I saw, I saw something really interesting. I think it was yesterday or maybe the day yesterday that I wanted to share. And this is on the topic of what's called threat monitoring, which I think is particularly helpful if you uh, um, had health anxiety, where you see that kind of the, the mind is just constantly looking for new threats, looking for things to keep us safe from, like looking for problems and th things like that, right? But where we cognitively know that maybe there isn't really a problem here, but we just see the brain just scanning, et cetera, right? And quick background, Sierra, who's been a guest on the channel several times, she said in one of the interviews we did here on the channel, something that, that always stayed with me. And she said that she had actually had a fire in her apartment they woke up because I think the fire alarm, they felt the smoke. And she said in that moment, she knew exactly what to do, right? There was no, like, you know, they, I think, she, you know, I, I don't know exactly what she did, but she said she knew exactly what to do. They called 911, they, you know, get the, get out of the apartment, everybody else was evacuated. And she said there was no hesitation. There was no doubt. There's nothing, we knew exactly what to do. And I, I, I thought like there's something real there, but I haven't really seen how to translate this into some teaching, but I saw this the other day. And so what's my point here? Well, here's my point is this. I think we can safely assume that when, you know, when we are, uh, when we're facing like a real tangible threat to us, like a fire in this example, you know, the brain automatically and instinctively knows what to do. It just does it. Like, like Sierra said, there, it doesn't need any coaching or supervision or like, you know, any guidance, it knows what to do. So that's kind of our first, you know, we can start there, you know, with this, with this knowledge inside or uh, at least our assumption that the brain knows what to do when we are in a real tangible danger situation. So that then leads us to the next part of this, this teaching, which is, okay, now we establish this, what can we deduce from those times where we're actually observing the brain scanning for threats we're observing the brain looking for problems we're observing the brain you know you know seeing if there's any danger right well to me like my the conclusion i draw i drew from this was the following that if we have the time and bandwidth to ponder this or to see this activity in the brain the conclusion is that there is no threat there is no real threat because if there was a real threat you know, we would already act it. The brain would have already taken care of it because that's what it does. That's what it's designed for. So this is, leads us to see that, okay, if we're finding ourselves, like if you're signing the brain scanning for threats, that itself is evidence that there is no actual threat. You know, this is not, you know, not medical advice and like this needs to be contextualized, of course, but I thought this could be really helpful for especially someone who's sorry, like, often sees that their brain is scanning for problems and scanning for threats to see that that activity in itself is evidence that there is no threat. And it's a similar teaching to um, when people ask, for example, Daniel, like, I think, I think, I think I'm going to go crazy. Is it possible to, to go crazy from, you know, not sleeping? And in an in a, in a odd way, the, the, the fact that we're thinking that proves our sanity meaning it's a very very common like when we've been in the state of like bewilderment and puzzlement and by the way i see several people are here like please uh, feel free to ask questions in the in the comment section and, and i'll reply live here um 
when when you know it's so common when we've been in a state of like bewilderment and puzzlement we don't know what's gonna happen and we're not sleeping that we, we the thought comes up am i going to go crazy am i going to be crazy and the fact that you know it, the fact that this this is such a common quest common thought a common thing to wonder shows that it, you know the brain it, it, it's normal like it's this is a very common thought a typical thought a normal thought in this circumstance and shows sanity if anything, it doesn't show, you know, it proves sanity instead of insanity. Like we're very sound, not crazy at all. Thinking we're, we're, we're going crazy is actually a sign that, you know, we have a you know, very sound mind, if you will. And there's one more example of this too, which is, um, the, in, you know, the a very common, you know, uh, concern or uh, idea or thought is my situation is so unique. My situation is so unique, and that could be for so many reasons, right? It could be like somebody who, you know, has a particular health concern or health issue or a particular circumstance or something like that. And again, the thing is that as a, as a coach, as a sleep coach, or maybe just as a member of this community, we know how common it is to think that our situation is very uncommon. So in a way, again, in a, in a sort of interesting twist the fact that we think my situation is very unique is actually proof that it is not very unique because that's such a common you know it's such a common idea to have such a common thought to have so to summarize these three things we can see that in in an interesting way threat monitoring is evidence that there is no threat or like taking no having the wherewithal to observe threat monitoring means that there is no real threat Thinking, I think I'm going crazy, is a sign of sanity. And thinking uh, my case is so unusual is actually evidence that it's not so unusual. So, I have a couple of things that I thought um, could could be helpful here. I see we're quite a lot of people live here, but so far I haven't seen any questions come up. So, um, I'll I'll share I'll share some other, some other random thoughts that come up. Uh, and uh, you know, if you don't have any questions, then oh here here we go. Uh, Dragos is live with us. Okay, uh, Dragos, so nice that you're here. Uh, thanks for thanks for thanks for joining. And you know, let me know if you have any questions. Of course. Um, what else uh, was I gonna say? Um, oh yeah, yeah. This is a nice one that I thought about the other day that I would really like to share. Um, have you ever watched a movie that you watched before, or read a book that you watched before, and read a book that you read before, and you actually know the end? Uh, you actually know what's going to happen. And let's say it's a suspense movie. Let's say it's a really exciting, like a thriller or something like that. And you're watching, you're watching this for the third time, let's say. Do you still get like, are, do you still get like into the story? Do you still get kind of excited? Or like, do you feel your heart beating and things like that as you're watching it for the third time? Probably. Like most of us, even if we know this is going to end well, that we know the ending, we still get excited. We still get anxious. We still get scared as we are, you know, watching this movie for the third time. And um, and to me, like when I saw this, I was like, this is really interesting. And it shows us that even if we sort of like cognitively, we, we know 100% with 100% certainty that it, there's nothing to worry about. We know exactly what's going to happen. That doesn't take away from the fact that we can experience, there can still be some anxiety, there can still be some worry around it. And And the way I thought this was helpful to teach was to see that if you're seeing like cognitively, like logically, <laughs> from a logical standpoint, you can see that I understand everything now. Like there's nothing to worry about, but I'm still scared. Well, that's just like when we're watching a movie for the third time. Nothing strange about that, you know? Uh, so that's where that came from. Uh, okay, so we have uh, some questions here. Um, Sylvia actually just says, hi, Daniel. It's been a while. How was your vacation? Uh, no, thanks thanks so much for being here, Sylvia. And um, it was really nice. Uh, I spent uh, like two weeks in Europe, mostly just hanging out with my parents. And uh, um, it was a really nice time. Thanks for asking. OK, Nicole is here with us and says, hi, Daniel, I have a question. I've struggled with insomnia for years. I lost my ability to nap. I literally cannot, no matter how tired I am. Have you heard of any remedy to recover this ability? All right, so Nicole, first of all, thanks for being here and for asking this question. It is a common one. and um, I want to say this, that when we start having the struggle with sleep, uh, 
and we see that you know before I slept just fine, other people sleep fine, then it 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 can seem so clear that we have lost something that we had before. You know, I've lost the ability to sleep or I've lost the ability to nap. I had it before and now I have lost it. The way I see insomnia is really that it's um it's just a surface manifestation of some type of fear or hyper arousal that when we are, you know, if we are, let's say, you know, we, we go back a few hundred years and we're living, you know, in, in, you know, tents or caves or something like that. And, and we hear some sounds and we think that, oh, there's an enemy tribe coming to get us. Then, you know, we're supposed to be more awake because it's not safe to sleep. We're supposed to sleep less and have more fragments of sleep and not nap because then we are, we are not alert. We're not safe, right? So I, the way I see it is much more that when we have been in a state of fear, it is very logical and natural and expected that we sleep less and that naps don't happen. It doesn't mean we lost something. It's actually just evidence that the work, the brain is doing exactly what it's designed for, which is keeping us safe but it is confused you know it is the confusion is that it thinks that not sleeping is the threat it's the enemy tribe it's the thing it's going to keep us safe from and now the fear of not sleeping keeps us from sleeping and keeps us from napping and so and this can you know this can happen literally how no matter how tired we are because again imagine if you're really really sleepy you're super exhausted and tired and, and you're about to drift off but then you remember like oh my gosh i left the oven on that's not safe. We're supposed to wake up even if we're super tired. We're not supposed to sleep even if we're super tired when the brain thinks that there is something to be afraid of. And so how does this change? To me, it's really a question of education. And when we understand sort of like, okay, we understand why this happens. We understand there's nothing to be afraid of. Then automatically the brain scales down this hyper arousal, these safety behaviors and safety mechanisms. And then sleep happens by itself. Nap happens by itself. So I think education is really, really helpful. Um, hope this made sense, Nicole, and thanks for being here and asking. Uh, we will continue with a question from um, Ashley, Ashley Sean. Ashley Sean says, I'm newly pregnant again and wondering, can lack of sleep hurt my pregnancy? First of all, congratulations, um, Ashley. And um, I wanna say that this question comes up very, very often. And um, as I often like to point out, like I'm not providing any medical advice here, anyone who's concerned about their health or, you know, or somebody else's health, their baby's health, anything like that, please talk to your doctor. But I will share this, that I, I, um, I review literature all the time and I've never come across any evidence that shows that um, lack of sleep, short sleep, insomnia can cause any health problems. I've never seen that it can cause pregnancy problems or cause health problems or cause any other problems like, like that. I've never seen any evidence uh, of that whatsoever. Um, on the flip side, we do have um, a lot of, you know, members of this community who have uh, had insomnia uh, before they got pregnant and they were worried, like, can I get pregnant if I have insomnia? And they got pregnant. We've had a lot of members here that uh, have had insomnia during their pregnancy and their babies were just fine. So um, I think actually I want to say this, that the absence of any evidence, like we can put it this way, if lack of sleep would cause some pregnancy problems, you know, lack of sleep is so common, either if it's from like insomnia or from other circumstances, you know, it's not uncommon to sleep less than like any ideal number, right? It's common. So I would say, I would also say that if it was true that lack of sleep could cause health, like health problems or pregnancy problems, we would probably know about them. You know, again, not medical advice, just me sharing my thoughts here. So Ashley, I hope that was helpful to you. Thanks for, thanks for being here. All right. Um, Sylvia I had a question too. My question is, can I fully recover from not sleeping? I think I sleep now for, I think one to two hours. Can it become more or is it going to stay so? All right. Um, thanks for this question, Sylvia. And to me, uh, this is this is sort of I, I think of this question as um, it, sort of like, is this as good as it gets? You know, and it's you know, I, I want to say this that 
I don't think any human being can like lose their ability to sleep and, and not sleep just like they did before or sleep well or sleep peacefully. I think that's absolutely possible for everyone. I think in fact, it's inevitable when we're starting to see that there's nothing wrong with us. You know, we're starting to understand what insomnia is, you know, sleeping peacefully happens by itself when we are on that path. So recovery is possible for everyone. Now, that said, there's a little tricky thing here, which is like when we when we start thinking like, okay, mm, things are, uh, you know, it sounds to me as if they're thinking like, okay, I, I, now, now we're gone maybe from sleeping not at all to sleeping maybe one or two hours. Is this as good as it gets or, or, or not, right? So on one hand, I want to say that everyone can sleep really well or without any struggle, right? That's possible for everyone. But on the flip side, when we think like, okay, so I just got to get better. I got to do things to get to three hours. I got to get to four hours. I got to get to five hours. Then we're in a struggle and we'll probably, you know, things will be probably be more difficult for us. On the flip side, when we're like, okay, this is where I am now and it's not where I would like to be, but it's okay for now. It, this is the way things are now. This is my normal for now. That really helps actually. Because then there's no struggle. Like we're not trying to get further and we're not trying to get further. That's actually, that actually happens by itself, right? So Sylvia, hope that made sense to you and thanks for being here. Michael says, how? Says Daniel, and I think there's more here. Hi, Michael. Michael says, hi, hi Daniel. Chronic is on for three years. Nothing has helped. Medication, sleep hygiene. Is it possible to uh, live your life with permanent chronic insomnia? Um, Michael, sorry, of course, to hear about this struggle, but I'm glad you're here. And, you know, on one side, I want to say, like, we have many stories on this channel of somebody who's had a struggle with sleep, aka insomnia, for many, many years. I think, uh, you know, there's many stories on this channel of people who struggle for 15 years, 20 years, and I know Beth, 43 years, you know. So, yes, it is very much possible to live your life with permanent chronic insomnia and often when i have guests like beth like you know neil and, and so i often ask this question like so you had this struggle for so many years what was your day-to-day -day life like how did you manage and the most common you know reply is something like it, it's sort of unspecific it's sort of like well you know it was not easy but i did it so yes it is possible now that said like does anyone like is this it is is it sort of like inevitable that somebody is in the struggle for for many many years i don't think that's inevitable at all and when i see this um when i see a a question like this or a statement like this and somebody says i've tried everything i've tried medication i've tried sleep hygiene i tried cbt i tried act i tried this then to me there's a real opportunity there because if we just look at the like basic fundamental truths of sleep it is that sleep is effortless, you know? If we ask that neighbor or partner, you know, the one that we sometimes want to strangle because they're sleeping so well, like, you know, that person who always sleeps well, and we ask them like, what do you do to sleep? They will give us the secret. They will say, I don't know, nothing really. So in a way, nothing actually really helps, you know, or, or nothing is where sleep comes from. And when we see this, and when we also see that, well, I've tried this, I've tried that and tried this, then we say, oh my, my gosh, Maybe all this trying is what has kept me from sleeping well. Maybe I ought to try not trying, you know? Maybe I should abandon this, you know? And in a way, when we say, like, I can, I can live with the way things are now, and I'm not going to try, and uh, I'm going to abandon trying, I'm maybe going to do some more education, that actually leads to where we want to leave. So in a, in a weird twist here, if we say, like, I can live this permanently, and I don't need to do anything further, that can lead us exactly where we want to be. Less effort leads where we want to be. So, Michael, hope that made sense. And thanks for being here. And now let's look at uh, what Sam has to share. Sam says, hi, Dan. What was it that made you move away from some of the principles of CBTI? Are there some CBTI principles that you still believe in? Thanks for all your brilliant work. Thanks so much, Sam. And yeah, this question comes up every now and then. It's, I, and, I, and I love to answer it because I get to talk about myself. And a lot of yeah, I, I like talking about myself, at least when... I feel like I have something to share, which I think I have here. And so uh, what was it that made you, made you move away from these principles? I saw them, I started to see them, many of the principles as quite problematic, specifically the ones that are called techniques. Uh, Trevor Youngquist, who's an a ACT therapist and also coach, um, I, I, I had a private conversation with him once 
I think on this topic, and I and I said this to him, I said, Trevor, you know, CBTI is great, but there, except for two things, there are two problems with CBTI, and those are stimulus control and sleep restriction. And he sort of laughed because, you know, to a large degree, that is CBTI, right? We often think of CBTI as like these two techniques of so sleep restriction and CBTI. And I do believe they are very problematic because of what I call implied controllability. Now, what was it that made me move away from these principles? Well, it was really seeing that they weren't helpful. And, and, and this ties in with implied controllability because the basic kind of understanding of, of insomnia in traditional CBTI is that, aha, there's insufficient sleep drive, you know, so sleep doesn't happen for that reason. And uh, we can override, any anxiety can be overridden by a strong sleep drive. And also like uh, insomnia happens also, not just because low sleep drive, because we started to think of the bed or the bed has become associated with arousal. Okay, those are the things. And we can, we can fix that by just getting out of the bed if we don't sleep and getting back into bed and, and when we sleep. So we kind of reassociate the sleep with the bed, right? And, and, and to, to, to do that, CBTI says, we use sleep restriction and, and stimulus control. And, and, and now you can see that sleep restriction in this way is, is the, the idea behind it is that, oh, if we just build a super strong sleep drive, that will make us sleep, which, which is implied controllability. It's, it's not said. I don't think a CBTI therapist will tell you, you can control sleep. You can control your associations. You can control your thoughts like that. But this is implied in these techniques. It's implied if you just get up early and stay up really late, you can control sleep is implied. And it is the desire to control sleep that is insomnia. So I think that's super, super tricky. Same thing with stimulus control. It is implied that if you just jump out of bed and wait, stay outside and then get back into bed when you're sleepy, then you can control these associations in our brain. And I think that's not possible. They just happen and we try to control them again into some struggle. So that's why I moved away from them. Now, are there some CBTI principles that you still believe in? Education. I 100% believe in education. And I think, I don't know if this is true, but I think of it as like the C in CBTI, cognitive, I think of it as education, learning that it's normal to wake up many times during the night, learning that most people sleep around six hours, learning that there's never been any evidence showing that short sleeper and sleep causes any health problems. That part of CBTI, the education part, I think can be really helpful. And um, I, I believe in that uh, very, very much. Sam, thank you. That was very nice uh, to get to answer that question. Uh, and Asha said, happy to hear this anytime acceptance. This is the way. Yes, it is the way. All right. Drago says, regarding controlling the thoughts in bed, I find myself obsessing over thoughts like when, how I will fall asleep. I find it difficult to mask these thoughts any advice here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to say that firstly, that thoughts are sort of like messages. You know, when we're aware of a thought, that just means the brain thinks this is something you should be aware of. This is a little signal or a message. And just like when we have a message for a friend of ours, and our friend goes like, "Yeah, blah blah blah," they just kind of ignore us. Then we're like, "What's wrong with you? Why can't? Why don't you want to hear this? I want you to hear this." And the more they sort of ignore us, the more we're like, what's wrong? Like, I want to tell you this. We try to tell them even more and more and more. So basically, like, the, 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 the teaching here is that I think this happens inside us too. Whenever there is a thought that we're aware of and we don't want to hear it, we're like, how can I mask this thought? How can I get away from this thought? How can I make this thought happen less? The brain goes like, oh, you don't want to hear this? I'm going to make you hear it. I'm going to say it over and over again, louder and louder and louder. So the teaching here is that the more we're, like, willing to hear thoughts, and just, okay, I heard the thought, the message has been heard, okay, I'm willing to hear this thought, that really leads to a place where the brain is like, oh, the message was delivered, no need to repeat it, and things get much more um, much more peaceful. So I think that's, that's, that's helpful to know. But there's another part here too, which is that I'm wondering when and how I will fall asleep. And the thing is that as much as I like to, I like to say when there's no longer any mystery, uh, then, then things will be easier, right? I like to say that because in, on the big picture, when it comes to insomnia, I think there's very little mystery. It can be very, it can be understood from a logical level. But there will always be some mystery in life, right? And, and exactly when I will fall asleep, exactly how I will sleep to all of us humans, that, that will remain a mystery. We cannot know that, right? And, and, and that can, it can feel like there's a, kind of like we're in a conundrum there because like how, I can't know the answer, but I want to know the answer. But so how, you know, what do I do? 
Well, I think it can really help to see that there are other parts of life where we have sort of been in this situation and, you know, uh, it no longer bothers us. And I, my favorite example of this is like existential questions, right? Many of us, particularly, I'd say, you know, during our teenage years or maybe early adulthood, a lot of us have those existential questions like, how big is the universe? Is there a true free will? Is there, a, is there an absolute, you know, good or bad? And if we think about that, we see that we probably didn't like resolve those. It wasn't like, like, oh, yes, I figure out all the existential questions. I'm good. Now let me move on. But rather it became a, a, a place of like, yeah, I, I, I don't know. You know, that, that is a mystery. And we can have these like unresolved questions and it doesn't bother us, right? It doesn't bother us. We can still live a free life, you know? So we can have questions like this and not find the answer and it doesn't need to bother us. So Dragos, I hope that made sense to you. Uh, and thanks for being here. Uh, let's see. Hello says, sometimes I don't even remember falling asleep after a whole night of struggling. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, th that kind of illustrates that sleep is a little bit of a mystery. Like we can, we can be super anxious and then we actually still fell asleep. Like, how is that possible? Well, you know, we, we don't even, we don't know. But I, I think the point is that we don't need, we don't need ideal situations for sleep to happen. And then don't remembering falling asleep, that can also be a little bit of like that paradoxical insomnia or like time traveling that there's much more on about this in this channel. But anyway, just my random thoughts there. Hello, I hope that makes sense. Phil is here with us today and says, hi, Matt. I just want you to know that after watching and learning from your videos, I'm sleeping way better and have a greater understanding of sleep. Thanks. Thankings, wash hands. Ah, that's amazing to hear. Thanks, Phil, for being here and just sharing that. It makes me so glad. So glad. And, and well done learning, contextualizing. Super nice. Liliana says, I had insomnia and got pregnant and had the same fear of not being able to get sleep to affect my baby. And there were days I didn't sleep and my baby's two months and now she's healthy. Oh, that's so nice. That's so nice. I hope Ashley, I hope Ashley heard that. Thanks so much for sharing that. And I think she did. Ashley said, I do it brain dump before bed and write down anything I need. Yeah, that can be really helpful. But that, thanks so much, Liliana. That's amazing. Amazing to hear. Amy says, I'm, I'm having a hard time staying asleep. I wake up several times throughout the night. It's so frustrating. Amy, I hear, you know, I, not long ago, I want to say maybe three, four weeks ago, I, I made a video called like sleep maintenance insomnia. And I think maybe watching that could be really, really helpful. And uh, oh, Ashley says, yay. Ah, that's so nice. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, Amy says, I read your book and it helped for a few months, but now I'm back. Okay, I hear. There's uh, another video actually that's called that's called um, The Sleep Honeymoon. And like, did you, I think I, maybe I put the thumbnail like, did your sleep honeymoon end? So now two things that maybe be really helpful for you, Amy, is like the sleep honeymoon one and also the sleep maintenance one. And, and actually like, and now I also think about the speed bumps playlist, which can be so helpful when we see things get easier and, and then we have a hard time again. Uh, but just to kind of pick one of these, I want to say that the sleep maintenance one is like, it can seem like when we have like fragmented sleep and we wake up at night and then don't fall back asleep, that it's different from like sleep onset insomnia. And of course, there's, you know, there's a difference between the two, but, but the, I don't think there's a principal difference. It's still the same thing. It's like, it is the fear of not sleeping that really keeps us awake. Um, so that can manifest in the evening where we're like, oh, okay, I'm supposed to sleep now. What if I don't sleep? Then it takes us a long time to fall asleep. Or we wake up, which we all do. That's normal. We wake up at night. And when we're not afraid of being awake, then we wake up and we, we see, okay, I'm awake and there's nothing going on. Okay, now I'll fall back asleep again. But when we have had that fear, like we wake up and then it's like, oh no, I'm awake. I'm awake. What am I supposed to do? And we see that it's the fear of not sleeping that keeps us from falling asleep when we have sleep onset insomnia, keeps us from staying asleep when we have sleep onset insomnia. Nothing strange or usual. Uh, it, it's just the same thing that's driving both, both these experiences of fear. So Amy, like maybe tune into those videos, hang in there and um, we'll conclude there for today. Uh, as always, I wanna say that uh, if you find, if, you know, like Phil here, if you're finding your way uh, uh, by contextualizing yourself, doing the work yourself, that's amazing, wonderful, and please share it. Uh, but if you'd like uh, some support and guidance, and if you'd like somebody to contextualize things for you, then please head over to our website and you can find coaching options, including 
talking to Coach Michelle, who's coming back from vacation. Uh, but yeah, that was it for today. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here, and look forward to seeing you back here tomorrow when we are talking insomnia and Friday and the rest of the week and next week as well. <laughs> okay, bye for now. Rooting for you. Take it easy.